Hey everyone, this is Abe at Flashback, and I'm here in West Covina, California, doing some retro game hunting at the Violence Flea Market. Hey everyone, this is Abe at Flashback, and I'm at the Redondo Open Air Flea Market in California. Hey everyone, this is Abe at Flashback, and I'm at the Mahai Flea Market, doing some more retro game hunting. So, let's see if I can find some cool stuff. Let's see what we can find. So retro game hunting is definitely one of my favorite hobbies. And if I see anything going on that has to do with retro gaming, it gets my full attention, which can be a bad thing sometimes. And recently I ended up taking a vacation where I ended up in Denver, Colorado and California. And I ended up doing a bunch of retro game hunting at the swap meets, which is one of my favorite places to find retro games. And here's a quick preview of some of the stuff I got. But before I go into detail with all this, I'd like to share my experiences with you at these swap meets and kind of show you the atmosphere of it all including the bargaining and what you can actually find at these places. So let's start off in Denver, Colorado at a retro game store called Games and Gadgets at the Mile High Swap Meet. And it should go without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway, this is a very cool store. Everything's so neat and organized and they have a lot of cool stuff. I was very, very close to buying this. This is a portable Nintendo entertainment system and I passed on it and now I'm kinda regretting it. And these guys are really cool at prices. If you shoot them a reasonable offer, they usually accept it. And look at that, the Nintendo Entertainment System power set, that's actually the very first Nintendo I owned. Racing against Cheetah on that power pad, he was no match, especially if you cheated and you used your hands. And check out this, the Odyssey, they got this price at 75 in a box and that's reasonable but they will bargain with you like I said. We got some Sega CDs, these are actually priced kind of high, I think they wanted 230 for that set, that's a little high in my opinion. But some of the stuff is priced really reasonable. And here's something you don't see much. The Virtual Boy. Maybe one of the worst consoles ever made, but it's still very interesting that it exists, and it's really cool to see it in person. And check out that controller, it kind of resembles a GameCube controller. Ah, and here we have the Power Glove. I see these quite a bit actually, but I've never seen with the sensors, so it's really cool to see this one complete with those sensors. The Power Glove's kind of got a weird place in history. It was really popular back in the day, and it's still a really cool retro item, but it never worked good, never. And a cool fact about the Power Glove is the first couple prototypes that they made of it actually worked really well and they were very functional, but they were so expensive to produce, so they ended up going back and redesigning it to make it affordable, and the end product ended up horrible. Here's another thing you don't see very often, Rob the Robot. In fact, I can't remember the last time I seen Rob the Robot, period. So at the swap meet, you'll find actual retro video game stores, but then you're also gonna find a lot of private vendors that might have some games and then a lot of other products. The private vendors usually don't do as much research, so the prices tend to be a little bit lower and there's still room to bargain. But every once in a while you're gonna run into a vendor that's just way, way overpriced with ridiculous prices. Like this guy right here. This vendor was asking $100 for a Sega Genesis Model 2 with one controller and no games. $100 is a ridiculous price, but that's just part of the game. And I did find quite a few good deals at the Denver swap meet, but unfortunately, I ran into some bad luck. After being there for only about an hour and a half, a flash flood happened with no warning. It went from blue skies to a flash flood in a matter of maybe two minutes. And sadly, a lot of the outside vendors didn't have time to cover up their products or get them put away. So for a lot of people, it turned to a complete disaster. I mean, there was TVs that were on out in the rain, they were plugged in, there was furniture outside, there was all kinds of stuff that was sitting out that got completely water damaged. And even retro games were a victim. I mean, look at all these games that are just completely soaked with water. As a retro gamer and collector, this was really hard to watch and witness. And I felt so bad for these vendors. They're just trying to make a living and then a freak storm like this happens. So after the storm was over, I was able to shop in some of the inside stores. But for all those outside vendors, they got shut down for the rest of the day. And I did try to help this guy. I offered to help him cover up his stuff, but he said it was too late and the damage had already been done. So even though that freak storm happened, I still picked up quite a bit of cool stuff. Now it's time to head to California. And down there I visited the Vineland Swap Meet located in West Covina, California. And I also visited the Rhodium Open Air Market located in Los Angeles. And what's really neat about both of these places is they're only open during the day. And as soon as four o'clock rolls around, they have to tear everything down and clear the place out because after that it becomes a drive-in movie theater and there's actually a giant screen on the edge of the lots. Then the next morning about eight o'clock they go and set up and start the whole process over again. And I grew up only going to the Denver Mile High Swap Meet, and it's quite a bit different. There's no drive-in movie theater there, 
that's just strictly a swap meet. One thing I like about swap meets is they end up being kind of like a time capsule. You end up running into things that you just haven't seen forever, and it just becomes a blast from the past. I mean, look at this Betamax player. When's the last time you seen one of these? This thing is giant, and it weighs like 80 pounds. Okay, now I'd like to share with you some of my bargains and deals as they were happening, and I got a couple of pretty good deals. 10? How about six each on each of these? Yeah, you do. These games are more expensive. Yeah, but they're, the labels are pretty faded. Mm -hmm. That's the best you can do on them. Each. How much on this? Nine? Nine? All right. Is that 15? All right, so 10 bucks, right? Yeah. How much? Xbox? This one, $30. 30? Yes. I ended up passing on the Xbox because I already have one, but $30 is a fair price. This is uh, 95. 95, huh? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, you know, this is $20. I included for you too. The unit is it's working, okay? Good condition, right? Yeah. Yeah, we can warranty everything. I don't have enough. How much do you have? Only 50. $50. We take credit card, man. Yeah. So 50 bucks? Yeah, yeah, 50. Okay. okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Here's an oldie I've never seen before, and it's made by Radio Shack, and it looks like it's a three in one console with three different variants of Pong. How much on this? How much on that? He ended up dropping this down to five bucks, but I just wasn't that interested. And I thought this was pretty cool. I ran into a bunch of old comic books. And on the back of a lot of the comic books, there was video game ads. Here's one for Battletoads. And Battletoads is actually a really good game. And look at this beast. Imagine trying to play games on this thing. All right, now I'm gonna go through all my items kind of one by one and tell you a little bit about them and how much I paid for them. Okay, I'm going to start off with Game Boy. Anything that's Game Boy related is going to be in this pile. And we'll start off with this. The Game Boy Pocket. So one of the vendors was asking $10 for this, which is a fair price, but this is a little rough. It's got some scratches and scuffs. It's not in the worst shape, uh, but on the back it is missing the battery cover. Uh, which, that's not the end of the world to me, because I have a 3D printer, so I can just print a new one. But I was able to talk him down to 4 bucks, and he accepted it, so... The Game Boy Pocket at four bucks is a great deal. That's if it works. So I took a gamble. I didn't know if this was going to work, and that's just kind of how swap meets go. But I looked out, and it seems to work just fine. Next, I got a couple Game Boy Advance games. I got Super Mario World or Super Mario Advance 2, Sonic Advance, another Super Mario World, Mario Kart Super Circuit, and Jimmy Neutron. And this vendor was asking ten dollars for each of these games but I was able to talk them down to $6 a piece, so that worked out to be a pretty good deal, especially for the Mario games. Okay, I got a couple Game Boy games here, and this is Super Mario Land, and the label is a little bit faded, but I was able to talk this guy down to six bucks, so I think that's a pretty fair price. And this is a Game Boy Multi-Cart, there's 132 games on this, and there's some decent games on this. I might actually do a review on this game because there's so many games on it. And they were asking 12 bucks for this, and I talked them down to eight, so for 132 games, I think that's a great price. Next up is a Game Boy Advance, and this was already priced really well. It was only 10 bucks. On the back here, they even wrote 10 bucks, and it's in permanent marker, so hopefully I can get that off without ruining the finish. But this is actually in pretty good shape. It's not my favorite color, but it works just fine. So I was more than happy to pay $10 for this. I did try to talk him down in price, but he was pretty firm on 10 bucks, and I thought $10 was more than fair. And on top of getting this for 10 bucks, I also got a car charger and a multi-link cable. And here's a Game Boy Color game, Duke Nukem. And this is a pretty good game, especially for the Game Boy Color. He was asking 10, and I was able to talk him down to six. Okay, next up here is the Game Genie. And this thing is so cool. This plugs right into the original Game Boy. It also works on the Game Boy Pocket, and it might work on a few other models too. So this pretty much works just like any other Game Genie. This end's gonna go into the console. And then on this side's where you're gonna put your cartridges. Then you have the option to turn the codes off and on, or you can reset the game back to the code screen. And on the back of here, in this little compartment, we have a little tiny Game Genie book with a bunch of Game Genie codes. So that's really cool that this book's in here. I've came across a lot of these Game Genies in retro game stores, 
but none of them had this little code book. So to have this code book is a huge plus. So it's an alphabetical order with just all kinds of different games. And they were asking $15 for this, which is a fair price, but I was able to talk them down to $10, so I was really happy and excited to get this for $10. So I'm going to go ahead and plug it into the Game Boy Pocket here to show you how it works. It just plugs into the cartridge slot back here. And then you put your game up here. And the game actually goes in backwards, which is a little weird. So on this screen is where you'd enter your cheat code, whatever that may be. Then you'd press start. Then you're off to your cheating ways. So the Game Genie for the Game Boy does look pretty weird, especially when it's on there, but I like it. Next up is the Gamester for the Game Boy Advance SP. And when I was looking at this, I had no idea what it was. I had to ask what it was. And what this actually is, is a three in one cartridge slot. And I thought this was so goofy and weird and unpractical that I just had to get it. And they were asking $10 for this and I was able to talk them down to five. But so I'm gonna go ahead and load some Game Boy games in the slots. One, two, and three. And now this plugs into the Game Boy Advance right here. So it just slides onto there like that. And then you can turn the Game Boy on right here and select between whichever game you want to play. Now you can't select a game while the power is on. The power has to be off. Then you select one, two, or three, then turn the power back on. So it's on slot three, which is Super Mario Kart. So at first when I got this, I just thought it was really unpractical and useless. And I just got it because it was weird and wacky. But after using this for a while, I found out it's actually pretty useful. It actually fits my hands really well when this is attached to it. One issue I've always had with the Game Boy Advance is that after playing it for a while, my hands actually cramp up because it's so small. When I'm holding this position for that long, it just starts to hurt after a while. And with this Gamester attached, it actually fits my hands really well. And I'm actually glad I came across this because I like it quite a bit. A lot more than I thought I was going to. And when the Gamester is attached, you still have access to a lot of different things. You got access to your volume over here. You got access to your shoulder buttons on the top. You got access to the power button, which actually links to the power button that's on the console itself. So this thing works much better than I thought it would. All right, next up is some Sega stuff. I didn't find a whole lot of Sega things, but I do have a couple good things I found. Uh, this is the Sega Genesis Model 2, and I actually did not have a Model 2. I do have a couple Model 1s, but no official Model 2. Although I do have a clone Mega Drive that looks very similar, but it's not the real thing. And they were asking $10 for this, and I was able to talk them down to $9. And it does come with two controllers, the AC adapter, and the AV cable. So for $9, I felt that was a really good deal. So here's a look at one of the controllers, and I believe this is actually the Model 1 controller, because I think when the Model 2 came out, they all had the six buttons. But I may be wrong. And I've tested this, and it seems to work well, but I did notice on the cord here, it looks like a mouse was chewing on the cord. So a lot of the rubber is chewed off in spots. But the controller does still work, but I probably won't use it just because of all those chew marks. And for the second controller, which looks a lot like a Sega Genesis controller, this is actually a standalone game system by EA Sports. It's got two different games on it. It's got Madden 95 and NHL 95. And I did test this and it seems to play just fine, but the two games that are on this are just games I just don't care about. So I probably won't play this again. And I also got a couple of Sega Game Gear games. I got Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and NBA Action. And he was asking $5 a piece for these and I ended up getting these for only a dollar a piece. And here's a couple more things I found that were Sega related. Uh, these are the demo discs that would have came with the systems originally. Uh, this is one for Sega Saturn and one for Dreamcast. And at one point I did have both of these discs in my collection, but for some stupid reason I threw them away. So I was really glad to come across these and these were only a dollar a piece. All right, next up is some Super Nintendo and some Nintendo 64 stuff. And I've been on the hunt now for quite a while to find a decent looking Super Nintendo. I did have one a while back, but I ended up getting rid of it because it had some really bad discoloration. On the outside edges here, it had some really bad yellowing. And I just couldn't stand the way it looked, so I ended up getting rid of it. But I finally found one that has some decent color to it, and it looks the way it should. And I found this one at the Denver Mile High Flea Market, and I got this for a pretty good price too. And the seller was asking $75 for this, and it came with an AC adapter, an AV cable, and one controller. But after bargaining back and forth for a while, I ended up getting this for only 60 bucks. And this is in way better shape than the last Super Nintendo I had, so I'm pretty happy to have this one. And there's no cracks or chips on any of the edges. A lot of times with your older consoles, you'll have cracks or a chip that'll be on the sides here or 
right on the edge. And this one's in really good shape. And one thing that's really weird about having the original Super Nintendo now is this thing seems huge. Because I haven't had this for a while and I'm only used to seeing the Super Nintendo Classic Edition, it just makes this thing seem gigantic even though this is the original size. And here's a look at the controller and overall this is in really good shape except for on the start button there's just a small piece of rubber missing but that's not that big a deal. And it didn't come with an official AV cable at that price, it came with this generic one but that's not that big a deal because I use SCART cables anyway. And as far as games go, here's a look at Super Street Fighter 2. They were asking $30 for this, but after bargaining for a while, I got this for only 12 bucks. And for Nintendo 64 stuff, I got a copy of Spider-Man. He was asking 12 and I got it for 10. And I also found a GameShark Pro. They were asking 15 bucks. I tried to get them to go down in price, but they wouldn't budge. And this cartridge seems to be kind of unique because on all the other cartridges, it didn't have this plug-in on the back. And I'm not even sure what this does. Maybe someone out there knows. If you know, go ahead and let me know in a comment down below. And this works just like a Game Genie does. On the bottom here is where it's going to insert into the console and it's going to plug in just like a regular cartridge. Then on the top is where you're going to plug in your actual cartridge. Alright, next up is a couple of Atari 2600 games, Miss Pac-Man and Junior Pac-Man. And they're asking 6 bucks for this one and 7 on this one. And I got these for $4 each. So the 2600 came out with Pac-Man first and that version of Pac-Man was not very good. Mix Pac-Man got a little bit better, but Junior Pac-Man is where it's at. This game is actually fun to play, the graphics are decent, the sound is good. I would definitely recommend Junior Pac-Man if you're looking for a Pac-Man for Atari 2600. Alright, next up I got some more Nintendo stuff. I got a Wii and a GameCube. And this Wii I picked up for only 10 bucks. It is a little rough though, it's got some scratches and scuffs. And on the side it's missing the, the door over here. And there is no controller included with this, but it did come with all the cables and that motion sensor. And I did power this up and test it out. And it works, but there's no sound. So I gotta figure out what's going on with that. Hopefully that's an easy fix. But I did get lucky when I turned this on to test it out. There was actually a disc inside of it. The new Super Mario Bros. Wii was inside this, and this game alone is worth about 20 bucks. So to get everything for 10 bucks was a good find. And I also found myself a GameCube. And I think I really lucked out on this one. They were asking 50 bucks, but they had it clearanced all the way down to 16 bucks. And there's no way I can pass up a GameCube at that price. That's a great price. And it's in really good shape too. There's a little bit of discoloration on the controller ports here, a little bit of yellowing. But overall, I'd say it's in good shape. There's no cracks on any of the corners. It's a little dirty, I need to clean it up. But and I've been on the lookout for a GameCube at a decent price for quite a while. And $16 is pretty much as good as it's gonna get. And it did come with the AC adapter and an AV cable. And this AV cable is actually a three-way cable. It's for the Xbox, the PlayStation 2, and the GameCube. It also came with one game, NBA 2K3. And this is a pretty good game. It's not worth much, but it is a good game. And two controllers, one official GameCube controller, and one wireless controller, but this controller is in pretty rough shape. And one memory card, so I got all this Nintendo stuff right here for only 26 bucks. All right, next up is some more Nintendo stuff. And at the swap meet, I came across a second generation Nintendo Entertainment System, and I had to have this. But I went back and forth on this guy with price for quite a while. This started off at 95 bucks. And he wasn't asking a crazy price for this at all, especially when it included the Mario Brothers 3, and two different controllers, and all the necessary connections, the AC adapter and the RF connection. But when I'm at swap meets, I really like to get a deal and most of your vendors will definitely bargain with you. So I went back and forth with this guy for quite a while and eventually I talked him all the way down to 50 bucks. And when I bought this thing, this thing was incredibly dirty. There was all kinds of grime and the creases and all the lettering. So after scrubbing on this thing for quite a while, it looks a lot better. And it's actually in pretty good shape. There's no cracks or anything on the corners. The color on this is good, there's no yellowing. And it actually works. That was one thing I was concerned about. A lot of these things you can't test when you're at the swap meet. So it's just a gamble. So when I got home, that was the first thing I did. I tested this out and it works great. And here's a look at the controllers. And this controller is actually in really good shape. This is the second generation Nintendo controller. And this is the original Nintendo controller. This one's kind of rough and it's got some scratches on the back, but it does work well. So the second generation Nintendo looks drastically different than the first generation Nintendo. And they made some major, major changes. As you can see, it's a lot, lot smaller. And instead of the games loading from the front, which was a horrible design to start with, they now load from the top. 
which is how they should have designed the original Nintendo to start with. Because there's all kinds of issues with loading games where you just had to find that special sweet spot when you'd load a game. You'd have to pull it all the way out and let it scrape as it went down and then just pray that it'd work. All kinds of issues. So on the second generation Nintendo, they did the right thing by making a top loading system and that works much, much better. And this was actually manufactured in 1993, two years after the Super Nintendo was released. And here it is next to the new Nintendo Classic Edition. And as you can see, there's not a crazy difference in size. Uh, the biggest difference would be that this has a cartridge slot, so it's taking up more room because of that, but the width is pretty close to the same, and as far as the rest of the electronics go, it probably takes up about the same amount of room. One big con about the second generation Nintendo is that it doesn't even have a composite connection, which composite's not that great to start with, but when you go to an RF connection, it's even worse because it combines your audio and video signals together, so it makes for a terrible connection. But it is what it is, and maybe there's a way to open this up and mod some internals inside there to get some better graphics, but for now, I'm happy just having the console. And I also picked up a copy of Excited Bike. This is a game I did not have in my collection. The guy was asking six bucks, but I ended up getting this for only four bucks. All right, next up is this Namco Plug and Play console, and it's got like five different games on it. It's got Pac-Man, Galaxy, Dig Dug, Rally X, and I can't remember the other one. And I paid like a dollar for this, so I didn't pay much. And what I got this for is modding. I really like this joystick on here, so I'm probably gonna use this for parts for a future build. And last on the list is a bunch of PlayStation stuff. I was able to find an original PlayStation for only 10 bucks. And it even came with a game inside, Gran Turismo. And I believe that was a two disc game, but I think you can play this one by itself. This is the simulation mode disc. And for 10 bucks, it also came with the AC adapter, the AV cable, and one controller. Also, for the original PlayStation, I found a Game Shark video game enhancer, and they were only asking a dollar for this, so I had to get this. And here is a Street Fighter controller for PlayStation 3, and I believe this is brand new. From what I can see anyway, I don't see any use on it at all. It seems to be in very good shape. I haven't tried this out yet, but I don't see any reason why this wouldn't work. They were asking 15 bucks, and I was able to get it for 10, and I really like the way this controller looks, and hopefully it works well. And here's a PlayStation 2 Slim. I do have a couple PlayStation 2s already, but I don't have a Slim model, and I've been looking for one of these for a while. And the seller was asking 30 bucks for this, and we went back and forth for a while, and we ended up settling on 20 bucks, and I got quite a bit of stuff with this too. It came with three memory cards and one controller, and the controller seems to be in great shape. It also came with a DVD remote and an infrared sensor, and this is the Sony brand remote, so that's pretty nice. And it also came with quite a few games. We got SpongeBob SquarePants, Battle for Bikini Bottom, and I'm not really into that. We got Simpsons Road Rage. That's actually a pretty decent game. Shrek Smash and Crash Racing. I've never tried it, but I'm gonna have to try it out. Shrek 2, I'll try it out, but I probably won't like this one either. Then we got some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is an okay game. Crash Bandicoot, The Wrath of the Cortex. This is a good game. Burnout 3, Takedown. I like that game. Open Season, not a fan. Over the Hedge, same thing, don't like that one. Ratchet, Deadlocked, this is a pretty cool game. I'll play this. Destroy All Humans, I haven't tried this one, but I'm definitely gonna try it. Ice Age 2 Meltdown, don't care for that one. Blitz, that's eh, an okay game. And Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, definitely a good game. And here's a look at the condition of the console. Overall, it's pretty good, but it does have some scuffs on it and scratches. But for 20 bucks, I have no complaints. I think it's in plenty good enough shape at that price. And I really like how much smaller this is than the original PlayStation 2. I mean, look at the difference in size, it's crazy. Well, that's everything, so it's time for me to go. If you liked that video, click that like button. If you want to hear more from me, please subscribe. And if you want to help support the channel, you can now find me on Facebook and Patreon. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.